Next up, we have three more fantastic speakers discussing how social innovation has helped to advance health equity at Sibley Memorial Hospital. Veronica Vela is the Director of Community Health and Innovation at Sibley Memorial Hospital, and she is going to introduce us to their amazing program and the other two speakers. Please welcome Veronica. Hi, my name is Veronica Vela, and I'm from Sibley Memorial Hospital, a member of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Mary Blackford is the founder and CEO of Market 7. She is working on addressing food apartheid in Washington, D.C. She was recently named as an honoree in the Forbes Next 1000. John Johnson is an award-winning storyteller. He is the founder and CEO of Verbal Gymnastics and redefined playback theater as a way to help communities heal from health challenges and trauma. His events bring together people to share their experiences. He has been a fellow with the DC Arts Commission and also played a pivotal role in Anacostia Unmapped, which captures the narratives of local residents in rapidly changing communities east of the river in Washington, DC. First, I want to talk about Ward Infinity, which is a model for developing community-driven solutions to address health disparities. Ward Infinity's mission is to partner with change agents to magnify their capacity to radically improve the health and well-being of underinvested communities. In Washington, D.C., we focus our work in Wards 7 and 8. Wards 7 and 8 are geographically separated by the Anacostia River. This physical separation was created during the early design of our city and with great intention. The river is not only a geographic separation, it also delineates how governments and institutions have failed over decades to invest in communities east of the Anacostia River. This is apparent when we look at the lifespans of residents who live in Ward 7 and 8 relative to other parts of the city. The chart on the left shows the lifespan of residents across the city's eight wards. Ward three on the top left is the city's most affluent ward with a lifespan of 83 years. This is where Sibley Memorial Hospital sits. As we move east, you'll notice that the lifespan declines and once you reach ward seven and eight, there is a 14 year difference. Residents in ward three are living an average of 83 years, whereas residents in ward seven and eight are living an average of only 69 years. If we look across other social determinants of health with regards to income, residents in Ward 7 and 8 spend about half of their income on housing. The unemployment rate is an average of 20% and in some neighborhoods it's as high as 30%. In some areas, household incomes is an eighth of the household income of um, areas more affluent in some areas, the household income is an eighth of the income in, in households of more affluent parts of the city. The infant mortality rate is three times higher. One out of four children have asthma, and there are only three grocery stores for 160,000 people. This is in contrast to other wards, which have upwards of 10, 11, and even 12 grocery stores for half the amount of people. A recent study showed that Ward 7 and 8 is less adaptable to climate change because really important services such as medical care, schools, and housing are located in flood zones. So you can see how this geographic separation is a call to action to invest in areas east of the Anacostia River. This work is necessary for three reasons. First, health disparities increase medical costs by $77 billion a year. It also increases indirect costs by $83 billion each year. The strategy that we take with Ward Infinity is to redistribute resources to increase health and vitality and thereby reducing those medical costs. Second, we want to increase inclusion. We know that vulnerable communities are often not consulted on changes that affect their quality of life. Our approach empowers residents to shape changes in their own community. Lastly, we really want to build trust. As we've all seen with the COVID vaccine rollout, trust between patients and providers can either impede or encourage healthcare use. 
our process listens and responds to community needs in order to build trust. Now that I've told you a little bit about our program, I want to tell you a little bit about how we got started. So in 2017, Sibley went on a listening tour to understand the challenges and opportunities facing residents living in Ward 7 and 8. We had listening sessions with groups, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and also drawing and chat sessions. I want to share a little bit about what we learned. This, these two images illustrate some of what we heard. The image on the left was drawn by a young child. The child explained that they lived in an apartment building. They explained that every day when they went to the park after school that they had to pass a liquor store. And in front of that liquor store, there were often people hanging out. And the child talked about just the discomfort of having to pass that every day when they were simply just wanting to go outside and play. The second image is an image of a woman and she's identified her own hierarchy of needs. And as you can see, it starts with mental health and well-being. What we realized from this listening tour was that the challenges and needs that communities have really varies on their context. And so we have to understand that context in order to come up with solutions that are gonna be effective. When we finished our listening tour, we actually came back with the community to talk about what we could do together. And out of this was born Ward Infinity. Ward Infinity is a program that builds on talent and expertise already in Ward 7 and 8. So we partner with change agents who have insights into the challenges affecting their own community. And we bring Sibley's social innovation method for transforming health. And those two things together, is what gives us Ward Infinity. Here's a little video that'll highlight the main parts of our program. The Ward Infinity Program is a social innovation program sponsored by Sibley Memorial Hospital and Johns Hopkins Medicine, where we invest in change agents who are working to improve the health and well-being of their community. The Ward Infinity Program started in 2017 after Sibley took a deliberate process to identify what are ways that we can begin investing in community and investing in community differently. The majority of the residents are long-term residents. They're African-American. Historically, the area has been deprived of opportunity. They have been deprived of opportunity and access, but they have been overpromised change and different things that would actually help them. We wanted to ask community, how could we partner and how could we partner in a different way? than what healthcare systems normally do. So in the last two years, we've invested in 20 innovators who comprise eight different teams that are tackling food access, so bringing healthy, nutritious food to communities. We've also invested in housing, making housing more affordable for residents, and we've also invested in creating healing relationships among patients and providers, as well as community members themselves. So the design thinking component is a very key piece. We have borrowed from the Stanford model and other models that help really shape how programs are designed with the end user in mind. And so the investments we've made have enabled the innovators to come with their idea to generate hypotheses and test solutions around how to solve a particular problem. Just hearing of this project, I was very excited to be a part of it because the Sibley Memorial Hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital, was great in reaching out to communities east of the Anacostia River to say, hey, we want to include you in the health of the whole of the District of Columbia. The key value that I found through the Board Infinity Program has been the power of for us, by us, understanding the importance of the community has the solutions that it needs to solve the problems. They came to us directly saying, here, we are willing to fund you all to put together a project that will benefit your own community. We're gonna facilitate, but we want you all to give as much feedback and help to lead the process. And it felt like we really were stakeholders in the whole process. The project that I worked on while I was with the Ward Affinity Program is called Market 7. Market 7 is a community marketplace that features Black-owned businesses for the purpose of alleviating food and retail deserts in Ward 7. And so we found that there was a direct correlation between the level of retail that's available in community and people's life expectancy. When they have proper access to food, they have a longer and more sustainable life. DMV Urban Greens is an urban farm right here in Ward 7. 
I grow vegetables and I sell vegetables and I donate vegetables to the community. In Ward 7 and 8, it's a food desert. All we have is two safe ways for Ward 7 and 8. When you go in the shop, everything is picked over because they serve so many people. So I feel good just having the fresh vegetables right here in the community for them. Playback Theater is basically an improv theater experience where we tell the stories of the community to give the community a chance to voice their opinions on the health disparities that are going on in the community, as well as take it to people who actually care. And Sibley and Ward Infinity was providing that space for us. We have a common goal, and that's to bring our community together to heal and get rid of some of these disparities. They gave us the opportunity to do, they really poured into us residents in Ward 7 and Ward 8 to actually look at the social determinants that are affecting our communities from a lens of health and really gave us the tools to solve them. And I think that is a great way to empower community, work with community, and provide resources to communities to actually effectively see change where you are. After doing the work with the Ward Infinity program, I was able to bring that knowledge back here to the community of Hope. I was able to enhance a lot of the care that I provide here and able to share that with my fellow colleagues. My husband and I decided to invest in the Ward Infinity program after we realized how very, very blessed we were to always be able to access really good health care. One of the really motivating factors for us was the connection with Hopkins. You know, Hopkins has the resources, the capability, the world-renowned expertise to be able to access what is really going to be helpful. And today, we've established those relationships. We're building trust. We're having conversation and we're growing closer and closer with our innovators, with other community-based organizations and other partners in the community. We're all working towards one goal. And so here we have from beginning to end, a solution that is entirely community driven. It is not Sibley driven. It is not Sibley's idea. It is not Sibley's initiative or Sibley's solution. It is truly a community of solution. The result of doing work in that way is that our programs and our solutions that our innovators implement actually have longevity and actually have staying power. So if you want to invest in a program that is not only going to improve the health and well-being of the community, but is going to do so in a way that is emotionally resonant with the community and meaningful to them, then Ward Infinity is that program. Next, Mary and John will join me to talk about their experiences creating compelling solutions for their communities. Together, we will highlight how these five strategies serve to advance health equity. The first one is being inclusive, which is allowing the community to share their opinions and to shape what we're doing. The second is having an asset-based mindset that is really focusing on the community's strengths so that we can build upon them. The third one is being holistic, so being mindful of the community context when you're developing and designing solutions. The fourth one is being responsive to community needs um, and their values in your work. And then the last one is making structural and concrete changes to rebalance the scales that have been imbalanced for so long. And with that, I'd love to bring on Mary and John to join us as part of the conversation. Let's start by talking about one factor that can help advance health equity, and that is inclusivity. John, I'd love for you to talk to us about the value of human-centered design and the fact that human-centered design is based on listening. Can you talk about the value of including the community in your listening? What kind of impact does that have when designing with the community? Um, sure, so um, I'm an artist. That's what I do for a living. Um, and part of being an artist is listening and capturing the narrative of the people or the story that you wanna tell. Um, when we were able to partner with um, Sibley, um, we had to go into the community and get their narratives. And oftentimes when organizations or institutions come into our community, they have a kind of a deficit mentality um, where they look at a community from all of the things that it is lacking and, and um, much of looking for the superpower in the community. Um, so from listening to the residents and, and seeing what their narratives are, for example, like if you live in a community that is impoverished, then the people who've been living there for decades are resilient in figuring out how to deal with poverty. And when you come from that approach and you listen to 
to their solution, they only need the support they often need is an institution to invest in their ideas. So um, we were very effective in, in getting information and also partnering with the community to come up with our innovative design, which is storytelling and playback theater. Awesome, John. I love how you've been able to transition, right? You're looking at one thing, which is impoverished, but you're looking at the other side of the coin to say like, okay, what what strength does that does that build in people who live in the community? Um, and I think this is this is related to what we've talked about before, um, which is recognizing communities as asset based, right? Mary, can you talk to us a little bit about what it means to recognize assets and what your journey has been like? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Mary Blackford, founder of Market 7, and we are a community marketplace that features Black-owned businesses for the purpose of alleviating food and retail deserts uh, that exist in Ward 7 and in Ward 8 in Greater East of the River. Um, we have been working diligently with community um, entrepreneurs that are in the area of the district to create alternative pop-up markets that include fresh food and sustainable lifestyle items. And so we have done over the past four years a series of pop-up markets that include small businesses coming together to create a space, a safe space for residents to actually get access to food in Ward 7 and Ward 8, where we don't have um, all of the uh, social determinants that would actually help us uh, get to an economic, sustainable place that would help us have greater retail options in terms of food. And so right now we're working on a 7,000 square foot food hall that will include foods from across the diaspora. This includes a community marketplace, a community grocer, um, and several food stall incubations that include foods from across the diaspora. And so we have worked really diligently to make sure that we find value where we are. A lot of people look at Ward 7 and Ward 8 and they look at something like our area median income and they say, hey, those people over there, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money, they don't have the economics to sustain any sort of marketplace. And so they continue to put cheaper options like fast food places because they'll say, oh, people in Ward 7 and Ward 8, they're only gonna spend about $10 a day on food. And the only thing that we can fathom is fast food. And that's not the case. And we had to, in a lot of our work with Sibley, demystify a lot of those sort of myths about how our community operates, what we can afford, and what healthy food actually looks like. And we've been able to do that by utilizing small businesses and urban farmers in our communities. That's amazing. And so wonderful that you've been able to tap into the resources and the passion and the work that's already going on in the community. John, I know in your work, um, and particularly talking about health issues, there are sometimes trusted voices in the community that are different than, you know, a doctor or a large healthcare system. Can you talk about voices in the community as assets for helping share health information? Sure. So, so one of the, the biggest things we, we found out from like interviewing the community, and we're from the community, by the way. So like the majority of people who are involved in this are from the community. So we already have like a cultural context for where we are. But the fundamental thing is we feel like the human story is like human DNA. It, it influences your fears. It influences, you know, what you, what you are willing to do, what you aren't willing to do. And um, so we, we found that um, th there was a lot of distrust from a predominantly African-American community and the healthcare system. So we, we had to come up with a way to somewhat bridge that trust. And that takes time. It, it was decades of, of mistrust. And now it's, it takes time to actually garner that trust. And um, most um, healthcare facilities are physician focused. Um, and in our community, one of the trusted voices is a nurse in our own community who works at a local, who works at the, the local hospital. Her impact is very different. Like when the pandemic hit, she was giving out masks. Now, I don't know if she got the mask from the hospital or not, but she 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 empowered our community by giving us masks. You know, she's the one, she, she's a vegetarian now. So we eat differently because she shares these stories and she has real time information when she talks about, you know, diabetes and she talks about all of these different things that she sees every day. And um, so her voice is just as important as Kamala Harris, who also came to the, our local hospital and got a shot, you know. So I think oftentimes we 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 dismiss what the local people have and how how connected they are to their own community and and most things that imported into our community when you can use the assets that already exist. I love that. Thank you for making that so clear um, and talking about the importing. Right, that you don't necessarily need 
people to be imported, you have someone right there who's trusted and it's really tapping in to that knowledge and that expertise to help share those, those health, um, the health advice with the community. We, we have a, a advisory neighborhood commissioner, ANC member, who's also another member similar to the nurse. They, they work on speed bumps and things like that. And again, we're living through a pandemic and there's a lot of distrust from the African-American community with the medical world. And so we had a community forum where we did some playback and some storytelling. And, you know, we, we got to hear the stories of like, you know, one person was like, hey, you know, every uh, zombie movie I, I see starts off with someone getting a vaccine, you know, just, you know, you and you welcome any idea. But this ANC member, a woman over 65, she got on the on and she told a story about being a child when polio was a big deal in America. And she talked about lining up in front of her school, going into the nurse's office, getting a sugar cube with the vaccine on it. And the nurse wouldn't allow her to leave until the sugar cube dissolved in her mouth and how we don't talk about polio anymore. And that's the reason why we should get this vaccine because there's an opportunity for us to have some type of medical intervention that prevents us from getting sick because we all know people in our families have gotten sick. African-American community is at the forefront of that. Um, so that's the power of storytelling. That's the power of actually looking into the community for the answers. Wonderful. And for those of you who haven't spent much time here, ANC members are locally elected positions in the community that represent different neighborhoods. And so it's, I love how you've shared that story, John, about how powerful, right? Talking about the polio vaccine um, from someone's perspective can help influence an entire community to take a vaccine. Thank you so much for sharing that. So moving on to the third factor that can really help um, influence and advance health equity. One of this notion is this notion of designing in a holistic way. Mary, I'd love for you to share with us how you've used Human Centered to design to create the concept of your community marketplace. Yeah, so over the past four years, we've had to create value in a lot of different spaces because, of course, the work of creating a health equity in our community comes at a lot of different intersections, right? Part of it is community, part of it is education, part of it is government and, and getting investments from outsiders, and we've had to kind of do it all. And so in terms of working with residents and making sure that we are including residents' voices in this, it was really great to go through the uh, human-centered design process because we got to really do a deep dive into some of our residents and their experiences as they transact in the community, utilizing some of the food sources that we have here. Um, we work with Sibley to do community surveying, but then also to have these deep conversations with community stakeholders about what they're actually experiencing. And it was so surprising to hear some of the stories. I remember one person told me, walking through the grocery stores um, at uh, in Ward 7, it feels like walking through the ghetto. Like, it, I feel unsafe. I don't feel like anyone can protect me here. And that's such an interesting take. So one thing that we did as we were building out our marketplace, we actually, um, we actually created a working group, a community working group that included about 70 residents. And we all got together. We literally built models using Legos um, where people actually built physically built out the Legos and they built out what they actually wanted this marketplace to look like. And we used color coding with the Legos to say, what kind of um, foods would you want? So maybe fast foods were brown and you want more vegetables that would be green or you want um, fast casual, maybe that would be purple. And we saw how much of what people wanted and people wanted more fresh foods. People wanted more veggies, people wanted more access. And so as we um, really kind of started to demystify a lot of the things that people talk about our community, we could take these things to outdoor investors like government and say, hey, you know, this is actually something that we really do want, contrary to belief, people do want these things. And so we were able to get um, government investment to the project um, to really, really um, start to think about, you know, how we can both utilize government resources to have effective and systemic change in community. That's amazing. I love the visual of everyone, work, you know, the, the working group with the Legos and color coding, the different things that they wanted to see. And it's so beautiful to see you go throughout your journey at different phases, utilize human-centered design to design for the whole person. Um, that's really beautiful, Mary. So one other thing that we've talked about as an important factor to helping advance health equity is to be responsive in the design of your solution. John, I wonder if you could talk about 
how you have adapted your solution to community needs over time. What have you, what are you doing differently now than maybe once you started? Okay. Yeah. So when we started, we, we were tasked to go into the community and find out what they wanted to talk about. So we started out with the information that Sibley gave us around, um, you know, the 14 year different in your life expectancy and how that made people feel. And then what, what, what type of health issues would we like to talk about? And the community mentioned two things. They say, we want to talk about reproductive health and they wanted to talk about mental health. Mental health was actually pretty tricky. Reproductive health was something we were able to tackle with our art forms. And it took us a while to kind of get it together. And since we have perfected it and we have like a prototype and we've been able to utilize it, um, it shifted to the distrust around the vaccine. And um, it, it, is, it is fascinating to hear what people think and, and to validate those thoughts and then have a trusted healthcare official or trusted community member to come in and give factual information. Um, it is, it is, it is alter the way that that we receive information, and it just gives um, we we set ourselves up for an environment where we don't feel like the minority, and that's a tricky term. But like when when all of community members come into a room and can share a story, they feel protected and they feel safe and they feel like they can share. Um, I think sometimes when folks go to physicians, they they have a, it's a power dynamic and they aren't able to share in the same way. So this was a, a wonderful community engagement approach. And we had to pivot because, you know, I mean, mental health and, and reproductive health are still important. But right now, um, this vaccine is at the forefront of the community's mind. And therefore, we shifted and we have to have a discussion about it. That's amazing. Um, I love that you've been able to adapt to what the community's biggest concerns are. And so clearly, as you said, reproductive and mental health will always be there. But right now, it's the vaccine. And that's so great that you're able to engage in conversation um, to understand what the community is thinking and also allow for the community to learn from each other. So the fifth factor that we've talked about are really structural changes, right? So not only do we need to be inclusive, do we need to focus on assets? Do we need to be holistic in our design to be and also be responsive to the needs? We have to also make structural change, right? That endures us as individuals. And so Mary, I wonder if you could talk about any structural changes that either you're making or you're influencing that's gonna help the next person who comes behind you? Yeah, so part of our work, our work kind of sits at the intersection of sustainable economics and sustainable health. So part of our work is um, making sure that we have the uh, connections and community to actually educate our residents on how to take care of their health. Like you said, there's a 14 year gap in between those who live in other parts of the city and Ward 7 and 8. So we're trying to figure out how to get that time back. And then another part of our work also is sustainable economics and actually creating systems that help us actually dispel some of this um, health inequity that currently exist in our community around we're waiting on big boxes to actually come and save the community. And so what we are trying to do is work with small businesses. And I think that that is a really big structural change to actually have sort of this like uh, enclave of black businesses come together and actually make sustainable marketplaces that automatically just are not seen as something that we could do this side of the river. And as we see policy change to actually support that, we've seen that we've gotten greater investment in community to actually do the work that we do. So that's some of those changes that we've seen over time. That's amazing, Mary. And I love that you're tapping, again, this is like focusing on the asset based, but also creating an on-ramp, right? And a way for small businesses to engage as you build your community marketplace. And that is so beautiful to hear about that really structural and concrete change that you're working towards. Um, so as you can see, there are five different ways that you, as you're thinking about developing new solutions, new programs, can think about how to advance health equity that are inclusive, asset-based, holistic, responsive, and also structural, so that those changes continue to outlive all of us. Um, before we finish, I'd love to hear, you know, entrepreneurs always have new things that are happening. So I'd love for Mary and John to share what's next in their ventures. Mary? 
Hi, so we are, again, we are opening a 7,000 square foot food hall right here in Washington, D.C. in Ward 7. Uh, we are coming together with eight entrepreneurs on top of the 60 entrepreneurs that we've worked with over the course of four years to develop this new space uh, that will include a number of different food stall incubations. And so if you want to know more about our work and get involved, please uh, reach out to us at info at market, the number seven dc.com or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at market, the number seven DC. Uh, we give lots of updates and you can see where our building development and processes. We would love to have volunteers. If you have any time, resources, space, please just reach out to us. We are always looking for a partner and community to educate, to uplift and to bring more additional food uh, resources to community and also uh, more opportunities to small businesses as we grow as well. So thank you so much for having what we're doing right now is again we are really working hard to have community conversations using art around the vaccines um one thing that we're doing for this conference is we have a lunch and learn where the participants of the of this conference get to share their own stories and they get to see how art can impact that and their sharing can actually be a connecting force um and you just have to pivot i mean this pandemic made people pivot to online um things and and i feel like sibley also has done that too. You know, I know when we were in the program, we would go up to Sibley, which is a nice and beautiful community, but it was great to actually say, hey, can we have these meetings in our own community? So we're talking about these liquor stores and we see them on our way to our meeting. It actually encourages us to even be more dedicated to trying to change it because we're meeting in our own community. So thank you. Awesome, John. Well, we look forward to the lunch and learn that follows um, today for, during the healthcare design conference. and. Um, Thank you all for your time today. We hope that you've learned about five things that you can do to advance health equity in your work. And um, we appreciate sharing with you. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Veronica, Mary, and John. The work you're doing in health equity and social innovation is incredible. And I'm sure that your approach is going to inspire others here to design with communities as opposed to for communities and incorporate the principles of inclusive and participatory design that you so elegantly presented to us into their work.